hold that I am a paradox. I'm a woman in STEM, a black engineer, and a Christian proponent of science. Now, you don't have to tell a minority that they're a minority, especially in my case, I knew I was. I didn't see people that looked like me in classes or labs, but I was interested to see the statistics for myself. So I turned to the National Center for Science and Engineering Statistics. Out of all engineers hired in America, 85% are men, and only 15% are women. Taking it a step further, out of all the engineers in America, only 3.4% are black men. And black women, 0.9%. We don't get a full percent? So, I guess it is unlikely, statistically, that I would be an engineer. And perhaps because of who I am, a human link of unlike things, I'm fascinated when I find things that I'm able to connect that might not ordinarily be connected. And one of my favorite examples of this is the golden ratio. Now, the golden ratio is the approximate ratio between the numbers in the Fibonacci sequence. And the Fibonacci sequence appears all over the place in nature. So, through this ratio, a pine comb has something in common with an ancient creature, and the human ear has something in common with a hurricane. And the golden ratio is not simply just this spiral. It can also be applied to not only just physical nature that you know, we interact with every day, but one of the biggest things that we can visualize, the galaxies in our universe. And one of the smallest things we can visualize, electrons and positrons moving and colliding in a hydrogen neon bubble chamber. Both of these things on opposite spectrums of science and size, combined by their spiral-like tendencies resembling the golden ratio. And this golden ratio, while a spiral, is also a specifically proportioned rectangle, which allows it to be applied to other things in nature, including DNA, you know, the proportions in your arm and in your fingers, but also to architecture and art. Two cornerstones of the human experience intertwined with math. Another unlikely pair is music and neuroscience. After a quick Google search of music and the brain, we can see the correlations between studying music and studying its effects on the human brain. So on your left, you have a pair of images, the first being the brain at rest, and the second being the brain when stimulated by music, and you can see the increased activity. On the other side, you can compare the functional and structural differences between the brains of musicians and non-musicians. So in this way, music helps us learn about how the brain was made, how it functions, and how it processes information. And this somehow led me into engineering. So I didn't want to be an engineer. Um, my first passion was and is music. And while I liked tinkering with things, was good at problem solving, and was always interested in little ways the world works, I was going to choose one passion, and my passion was music. Then I was exposed to the 14 Grand Challenges of Engineering, released by the National Academy of Engineering. One of these challenges was reverse engineering the brain. But the way that it was told to me was a way to combine music and engineering, because studying music and its effects on the brain tell us about the brain, and being told things about the brain will let us be able to develop drugs to combat degenerative brain diseases or drug delivery systems or anything imaginable. So I could combine 
my two passions. And I was over the moon because this is my dream. But this is when I started to realize the fact that I was a minority. I didn't have peers walking alongside me in my advanced classes. I was discouraged by people my own age not to pursue scientific ventures because, oh, as a girl, you know, I can't be taking it seriously. This is for real scientists and, you know, you know. I was told a woman belongs in the home and not pursuing higher education. Excuse me, sir, you're a whole adult. Okay, okay. But as an adult, and me, seventh, eighth grade, what he said had to be right. And so I was fighting within myself, trying to choose the parts of me that I subscribed to the most. And I found myself in a very dark place. But in the midst of discrimination and self-doubt, I turned to another passion of mine, my faith. After some searching, I found over and over again my God being displayed through weather, through the sky and the stars and nature as a whole. I had found a link between science and my faith. Well, now I was all in. And so instead of fighting within myself, I redirected the fight and fought against the forces trying to stifle my distinctive voice. And the strength that I used to fight this fight did not come from me thinking, oh, you know, I'm brilliant, so I'm going to be an engineer and I'm going to be the best engineer and yet. No, I don't feel that way. But the conviction you have in your idea and the yearning you have to solve the problems faced by humanity will be your emboldening driving force necessary to go after your passions and help solve those challenges. My conviction came from seeing the combination of my passions and seeing them come together in a beautiful way and help me solve challenges. My conviction came from seeing how my background as a young black female engineer let me have a unique perspective on solving problems and addressing solutions and even defining issues, which actually made me an asset in lab projects and teams. And I'm reconvinced. Every time I walk in a lab, I feel the same flutter that I felt that first day in sixth grade where my dream began and the last day when the final puzzle pieces combined and I saw all of my passions linking together in this one challenge. So, I am an untraditional engineer who came to love engineering in a non-traditional way. And although it is unlikely that I'd be an engineer, I don't want to seem like a contradiction, but instead want to change the definition of what an engineer actually is. So don't view me as a paradox, but rather as an emerging paradigm. <laughs>